We can stand. <clears throat> Time to dismiss the children downstairs to participate in their uh, children's church down there. I stand to praise you, but I fall on my knees. My spirit is willing, but my flesh is so weak. Light the fire in my soul, fan the flame, make me whole. Lord, you know. a mighty rushing wind light the fire in my soul fan the flame make me whole Lord you know where I've been so light the fire in my heart again Light the fire in my soul, fan the flame, make me whole. Lord, you know where I've been, so light the fire in my heart again. Please be seated. Good morning. I want to also extend uh, congratulations and thanks to the mothers who are here. Uh, and on behalf of Kathy and I, we, we just want you to know that in addition to our own mothers, we've been blessed over the 30 years or so that we've been at North Park with some surrogate mothers, some Christian women who have kind of filled in at times and, and kind of been motherly to us. And so we're very thankful to those of you who have done that. And also, uh, Kathy and I grew up in families where there, we didn't have sisters. She had five brothers, I had two. And so again, there are a number of you here who um, have been and continue to be like sisters to us. Not just in, from a Christian standpoint, but even closer than that as far as just from a physical bond that we have. And so we want to thank you for that as well. And, and I uh, hope this is a great day, uh, not only for us as we worship together, but that uh, you know those who are mothers here will, will be honored uh, by your families. A woman was in a grocery store and she sees a man pushing a grocery cart and he has a very fussy two-year-old in that grocery cart. And so she overhears the man whispering, be patient, Billy. You can handle this, Billy. It's okay, Billy. The woman came over to him and said, you know, I, I don't mean to interrupt your shopping, but I just have to tell you how wonderfully loving and patient you are to little Billy. And the man said, well, to be honest with you, my son's name is Patrick, and my name is Billy. And you know, perhaps we've all been there at some point in time at others, especially when we let our children push the grocery cart and they nail us in the Achilles, you know, and things like that. So, um, but uh, as I thought about the message today and, and kind of what I, how I wanted to entitle it, uh, as we kind of get close to, we've got one more uh, lesson from uh, James, but today I, I went back in time and some of you may remember uh, the television series Kung Fu. 
uh, with David Carradine, as, uh, and it would flash back to him as a, a youngster, as Cain the youngster, and then he became a man. And when he was a youngster, his teacher, Master Poe, would often say to him, Patience, Grasshopper. <laughs> and so that's my title for today, Patience, Grasshopper, because we all need patience, and probably moms show it and need it more than many, but they tend to have a really good handle most of the time on being patient. So, you know, James in his teaching, if you have your Bibles and you want to turn to James chapter 5, we're going to look at verses 7 through 12 today. And so he gives us some additional instruction about patience. And because I think he feels like it's important for the Christian not only to know about it, but to embrace patience because of the issues that could happen if you're impatient. And we're going to touch on those. You know, he touched on, <clears throat> excuse me, at the beginning of his letter, he kind of touched on patience a little bit. But then he comes back to it at the conclusion of his letter, and he really kind of hammers it home a little bit harder. And I think in his, in his letter, whether he implies it or he states it, there's three things that I think he, he really wants to emphasize when it comes to patience or a lack of patience. I think one of those that's probably implied here is that too many times, if we're impatient, we make poor decisions. That we can be hasty in our decisions. And as a result, we may even be unwise or foolish in our decisions because we didn't practice patience. I think a second thing that he brings out very clearly in his letter is that, and he speaks directly to the Christians that he's writing to, so I would say he speaks directly to us, that it is important in our relationship with one another as Christians to practice patience. Because if we are impatient with one another, if we say things hastily, if we do things hastily with one another, it can hurt not only that individual, but can actually hurt the church. And so James is trying to write this letter to the first century Jewish Christians and really emphasizing that if you want to be a strong church body, a strong church family, individually you need to practice patience. And then third, I think that he again is really clear that if we aren't patient, what we're really saying as Christians is that we don't really have faith in God. If we don't allow God to work in our lives, if we feel like we have to make the decision in a hurry or without even allowing God to work, then we're really in essence saying, well, we don't really trust God that he's got enough juice to do what we need him to do. And so I think James is really trying to emphasize to these first century Jewish Christians that have been scattered throughout Palestine that in order to be strong in the Lord and remain that way, in order to have a strong relationship with one another as Christians, in order to really draw closer to God instead of pulling away from God, we need to practice patience and allow God to work in our lives. So I want us to, to take a look at James chapter 5 as we begin. And, and you may want to keep your Bibles open there if you have them and you want to do that because we'll refer to these passages a couple more times you know, yet this morning. So James chapter 5, beginning of verse 7, he says this, and it's, again, comes right out of the gate. Be patient then, brothers and sisters, until the Lord's coming. See how the farmer waits for the land to yield its valuable crop, patiently waiting for the autumn and spring rains. You too be patient and stand firm because the Lord's coming is near. Don't grumble against one another, brothers and sisters, or you will be judged. The judge is standing at the door. Brothers and sisters, as an example of patience in the face of suffering, take the prophets who spoke in the name of the Lord. As you know, we count as blessed those who have persevered. You've heard of Job's perseverance and have, been, have seen what the Lord finally brought about. The Lord is full of compassion and mercy. Above all, my brothers and sisters, do not swear not by heaven or by earth or by anything else. All you need to say is a simple yes or no. Otherwise, you'll be condemned. 
At the beginning or near the beginning of verse 7, there's, a, there's kind of a, a transitional word there. And in your version, it may be therefore or it may be the word then. But what that means is that it refers back to something that already was covered. And so in James 5 verses 1 through 6, James had already talked about those really mean, nasty landowners and merchants who took advantage of their workers and didn't pay them wages and were so concerned with building their wealth and their riches that they took advantage and they really harmed maybe even some of the Christians that James is writing to because they just refused to pay them or they cheated them out of what was owed to them. And so he's referring back to that and he's saying, look, if that happens to you, and then in start in verse 7, he says, be patient. Let God work. Let God be the judge. I think he's really talking there, too, about warning them not to make hasty decisions, not to react when somebody wrongs you in some way. Somebody says something that you don't like. Don't react. Don't retaliate. Because if we're not patient, we can make some foolish decisions. And so I think he's, he's referring back to that as he continues writing about patience. And then to further kind of enhance what he's teaching the believers and what he's teaching us today, to wait patiently for Jesus' return. James describes this familiar scene, and I have to think when I first read it, James is taking a page out of Jesus' book. You see, Jesus taught in parables, and he'd always pick something that everybody knew about, whether it was sheep or fish or planting seeds. So James talks about the farmer, and he uses that as an example to reinforce this idea of patience. And so he describes a familiar scene about the farmer. And basically what he says is that the hardworking farmer can prepare the soil, can plant the seed, can weed the field, but he can't make his crop grow. Still, what he planted is worth waiting for. And then he goes on to say that, that the farmer is really helpless and he has to rely on nature to take its course. The weather is completely beyond the farmer's control. Rain is needed in order for the crops to grow, but too much rain can cause the crops to rot. Too much sun can cause them to burn up. The weather, James is saying, helps the farmer develop patience, just like trials can help believers develop patience. Now, I've got to believe that by using that example, people could understand a little bit better what James is trying to say when it comes to patience. And so he actually makes application in verse 8 of that. He says, you too be patient, stand firm, because the Lord is coming near. The fact that the farmer and the Christian have something worth waiting for. For the farmer, it's a great crop that'll come. And for the Christian, it's a heavenly home when Jesus returns. And so James is saying, be patient, just like that farmer. The reward will come. Same for the Christian as it is for the farmer. Wait for your reward. Three times in verses 7, 8, and 9, he kind of refers to Jesus as coming back and how, how eventful that will be. And that regardless of what you've had to put up with in life, it'll be worth it. It'll pale in comparison. Whether you've had heartache or suffering or illness or, or people have, have criticized you unfairly in life. James is saying, be patient. Because God is going to right all the wrongs when Jesus comes back. When Jesus comes back, all those who have wronged you or wronged others, God is going to take care of them. Just hang in there because there's something better waiting for you. And there's something better waiting for us as well. The hope of Jesus' return, I think, gave those early Christians a reason to continue. To not give in to maybe selfish human desires to retaliate, to get back at somebody, to to say bad things or to, to do something that really they shouldn't be doing. He's kind of saying, you know, hang in there. It'll be better. There's something better coming for you. In verse 9, 
he depicts Jesus Christ as the judge. And he's basically saying, look, when Jesus comes back, he's going to punish those who deserve punishment. You don't need to do that. You don't concern yourself with that. God will take care of that. Jesus will take care of that as the judge. And again, I think it has to do because he's, he's talking directly to brothers and sisters. How many times does it say that in that passage? He's talking brothers and sisters. He's talking to those early Christians, but he's talking to you and I as well. And he's talking about relationships and how being impatient or being about trying to get back at somebody because they wronged you. Yes, and that happens even in the church, but that can sever and really injure relationships within the body. And so be patient, he says. Be patient. Practice patience. Because relationships with other Christians are important and we don't want to harm those. We want to build on those. He points out that a grumbling, complaining attitude will prevent us from developing patience. He talks directly about that. He's, he said grumbling, even grumbling about the world and, and our negative situation isn't the answer. Grumbling really doesn't solve anything. And grumbling to one another or against one another, well, that goes against God's plan. It goes against God wants us to be what, what God wants us to be about. In Philippians chapter 2, um, Paul writes this. It's a familiar passage. He says, do everything without grumbling or arguing. And why would you do that? Well, he's really kind of taken, it's similar to what James is saying, so you may become blameless and pure, children of God without fault in a warped and crooked generation. And here's why you want to do that. So you can shine among them like stars in the sky as you hold firmly to the word of life. And then Paul puts a little bit in there for himself. And then if you do that, then it's, e it's, it's clear that I didn't waste my time trying to teach you. And then I'll be able to boast on the day of Christ that I didn't run or labor in vain because you, Christians, in this case, he's writing to the Philippian church, you listened to what I was trying to teach you. So Paul, just like James, is saying, you know what? The grumbling and complaining doesn't solve anything. In fact, it harms, it harms us. It harms how people see those who say they are Christians. Again, grumbling, arguing, arguing and complaining to someone against someone, it goes not only against God's teaching, but it demonstrates that lack of faith that I mentioned that, that James is trying to emphasize. If we, if we grumble and complain and we're impatient in what we do, what are we saying? We're saying, well, God can't handle it or isn't going to handle it, so I need to. Not what God would have us do. And not only that, it can damage our influence on others. We won't shine like stars in the universe. We've all been in grocery store lines where we've listened to the person who's checking out and maybe the teller themselves and they're grumbling about their job and they haven't had a break and they don't get paid enough and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. We don't want to, we don't want to be a grumbler or complainer because how can we do that and then say to someone else, oh, I follow Jesus. I believe in God. I'm a Christian. James is, James is really strongly advising against that approach. And then he goes on a little further in verse 10. I mean, James is on this patience thing, and he is not letting up. He points out that in verse 10, the example of the prophets and how they had to endure a lot of stuff, a lot of bad things. But yet they didn't show a lack of patience. And he uses one example, and here's one example rather in particular, the example of Jeremiah. Listen to what Jeremiah had to go through. So here's one prophet, Jeremiah. God called him as a teenager while he was still living in a tiny village. And, and after Jeremiah preached his first sermon of radical repentance, his own family tried to kill him. What a way to start your ministry, right? And then he went on, still committed, he stood at the gate of the temple during a big feast time, and he told the assembled people that their worship was worthless because they had no intent to obey God. 
And so then the religious leaders tried to kill him. And then they ended up instead beating him and stretching his limbs in between stocks. Just a painful punishment. But it didn't stop Jeremiah. So Jeremiah wrote his book that we know of as the book of Jeremiah. And he wrote the book and, and when, once it was written or the letter was written on parchment, the king at the time took the thing, cut it up and burned it. Still didn't stop Jeremiah. King Zedekiah, what he does is he wrongly imprisons the prophet. He throws him in this muddy deep well and he leaves him there to die. And even then, Jeremiah didn't complain about God not taking care of him. He didn't complain about his captors. He remained faithful to God, and God took care of him and actually fed him and eventually got him out of that deep well. And then one day, Zedekiah, the king, summoned him and asked for his own, asked for Jeremiah's advice. And Jeremiah told him very plainly this in Jeremiah 38, 20. He said, Obey the Lord by doing what I tell you, then it will go well with you, and your life will be spared. You see, through all that happened to Jeremiah, all those evil things, the people that tried to kill him, him getting blamed for stuff and thrown in a well, left to die, James didn't complain and grumble. He ex exercised patience because his faith was in God. And that's what James is trying to stress to those first century Christians and I think even to us today because you know what we're gonna have difficult times we may not have the kind of times that Jeremiah had in fact sometimes here's what we get we become the person maybe that quits coming to Sunday school because maybe the teacher disagreed with something we said in class that's our trial that's our difficulty or maybe we quit giving because we don't like the color of the carpet. Or the preacher goes five minutes long and we miss the start of the football game. So we're, I'm just not going there anymore. How does that, that doesn't compare at all to what the prophets put up with. Yet the prophet didn't complain, particularly Jeremiah, didn't complain, he didn't grumble. He wasn't impatient. He trusted God. We need to trust God. And James goes on to highlight the blessings, really, that come to those who do exert patience, that do exhibit patience in their lives, that God will bless them. And it'll strengthen our relationship with God by exercising patience. God is the source of all blessings. And even he goes on, James does, to talk about Job. And Job is legendary, the story of Job. And even with Job... Job, he didn't curse God. Even though his wife said to him, curse God and die, basically his wife said, just kill yourself, Job. I mean, God had let the devil kind of do as he will with Job, and so he lost his wealth, he lost his health, he lost his children, and yet Job was still patient through all of his trials. He didn't blame God. And he was rewarded as a result. You see, in Job's example, I think, we find encouragement and the power to persevere even when life can be very dark for us. And I don't know if it could get any darker than it did for Job when it comes to you and I. You see, Job was rooted in God. His faith was rooted in God. Consider this. In verse 11, James says, We count as blessed those who have, been, who have persevered. You've heard about Job's perseverance, and you've seen what the Lord finally brought about. The Lord is full of compassion and mercy. That's what we need to remember, even through those difficult times. And then think of this, too. If there's nothing to endure, how can we learn endurance? If everything is easy and given to us, we don't learn anything. We can't persevere unless there are trials in our life. There can be no victories without battles. There can be no peaks without valleys. There can be no joys without sorrows. 
There can be no blessings without sufferings. If we want the blessing, we must be prepared to carry the burden and fight life's battles. God, in the case of Job, first humbled Job, and then God rewarded him with blessings. God will reward us with blessings as well, providing we are patient and our faith is in God. You know, we live in a world today that is very impatient. They want everything, we want everything, they want everything right now. And they want a life of ease. And if they don't like something, they just quit. If they don't like the way a relationship is going, they quit. If they don't like the way the job is going, they quit. And it's hard to break that pattern. But there are things that we can't change. And that's where we need to rely on God. And that's where James is saying, exercise patience in all things. Verse 12 looks a little, to me, a little out of place, but I didn't write it, so I'm not saying it is. God inspired James, so I'm not, sorry, I'm not saying you've messed up. But as I look at it, I see where it fits. He's talking about patience, and then he goes on to verse 12 and says, Above all, my brothers, do not swear, not by heaven or by earth or by anything else. Let your yes be yes and your no be no or you'll be condemned. And as I thought about that, he, James is really, through his whole letter, is talking about how to live as a Christian. He's talking about practical Christian living. These are the things that Christians should be about. And so here, he kind of puts in this idea of integrity, who we should be and how we should act. And I think what he's saying is he's warning against us losing self-control being impatient, and that loss of self-control causing us to say things that we really shouldn't say. Maybe causing us to say something, use the Lord's name in a way we shouldn't, or to swear on something to kind of guarantee that we're going to be live up to what we said. You know, it used to be a, a phrase that goes, my word is my bond. Some of you will remember that because it goes back a long way. Where basically, if I say something, you know, I don't need to sign anything, I don't need to stamp anything. If I say it, that's the way it is. Well, we've gotten away from that. But James is saying, you know, don't let circumstances change who you are. Live as a Christian because of who you are and whose you are at all times. Whether it has to do with patience or love or commitment or the things that come out of our mouth. Our lives should be a testament to our character so that what we say as a yes, that's what we mean, and what we say as a no is a no. Let our integrity, let our character as a Christian be all that we need. So where are we when it comes to patience? I mean, Peter wrote this. He said, so then those who suffer according to God's will should commit themselves to their faithful creator and continue to do good. Peter's saying, you know, we're going to have difficult times, whatever those are. But if we're doing things to please God, and we commit ourselves to that faith that we should have in God, and keep doing good, God is going to take care of us. He is going to take care of us. Like the farmer... We look ahead with hope and patiently wait. Like the prophets, we do God's will. And in spite of strong opposition, we stay the course. Like Job, we don't let life's circumstances cause us to change who we are or in whom we place our trust. You see, in every one of those cases, all, all are rewarded for their patience we will be rewarded for our patience by placing our trust in God at all times, in all circumstances. Paul would write in Romans 28, 28, and we know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him and who have been called according to his purpose. Love God, he's going to take care of us. 
said earlier, I thought there were three things that James is trying to bring out that sometimes we can be impatient and we can make decisions that are foolish and untimely. And maybe we can look back on those individually throughout this day or next week and say, yeah, oh, I messed up on that one. And then we learn from that and try not to do that again, to maybe practice more patience, more wisdom. Maybe there's been times that we've said something to a brother or sister that, you know, has caused a riff to occur. And it could have been last week or it could have been 20 years ago, and that still may be the case. Our relationship isn't there, and maybe we need to realize that we need to be more patient. And whether that means go to that person and say, you know what, you may have forgotten, but I still remember what I said to you, and I shouldn't have. I was impatient, and I didn't put our, my faith in God. Or just maybe our relationship with God isn't what it should be, period whether it's patience or obedience or whatever, James is saying, in all circumstances, maintain a right relationship with God. And so, if you haven't created and started a relationship with God, here's a good time to do that. We're going to sing a song in just a second. And it's an invitation. And if you have come to realize that God needs to have a more prominent place in your life, this would be a great time to, to either make that decision publicly or simply to say, you know what, I, I became a Christian a long time ago, but man, I don't put my trust in God like I should. In either case, let's listen to what James had to say. Let's all be more intent on practicing patience and putting our trust in Almighty God. Let's stand together and sing.